On the last slide, you know, we talked about forks, so how miners, even when they're just, you know, playing by the rules and following uh, the Bitcoin protocol as intended, uh, sometimes by chance, two different miners will uh, happen to discover eligible blocks at roughly the same time. Uh, and then we talked about the longest chain rule, which is what Bitcoin uses to resolve the ambiguity when you have a fork uh, in the blockchain. Now I want to turn our attention to incentive issues, so much more in the, in the kind of spirit of this course. Um, so remember, we've already seen how, how incentives pop up in Bitcoin. Miners are incentivized uh, through both, the, you know, principally through the block reward, the 6.25 Bitcoins, but also um, some additional transaction fees. Uh, they're incentivized, they get monetary rewards uh, for solving these crypto puzzles, for um, adding eligible blocks to the blockchain. And so that's good, right? So that's clearly going to motivate the miners to do this work we want them to do. But whenever you introduce incentives like this into a system, uh, it introduces or potentially opens a whole new can of worms. And you have to ask yourself, you know, by having these incentives built into the system, are we actually incentivizing miners in this case to behave in some way we weren't expecting? So what we really want to do now is put ourselves in the shoes of a miner and ask, you know, if we were sort of devious and we were potentially going to deviate from the prescription of the Bitcoin protocol, is there any way we could do so that we, where we'd be better off? Where, for example, uh, we would garner more rewards than we would have had we followed the protocol honestly. Those are the kinds of vulnerabilities in a protocol we would like to detect. Let me start just with some good news, which is a potential attack by miners that we might be worried about, but which actually is completely ineffective because of the proof of work nature uh, of Bitcoin. So it's something that's known as a Sybil attack. Um, it's so-called uh, after a 1973 book uh, called Sybil, which was about uh, a woman who had what at that time was called a multiple personality disorder. And so then a Sybil attack in a, in a computing system, that involves inventing multiple identities for yourself and trying to use your multiple identities in concerts uh, to somehow make yourself better off. And for an open system like Bitcoin, it's very important that you're robust to civil attacks because civil attacks are incredibly cheap to mount. So remember, you know, in Bitcoin, the users are identified only through one of these public keys, you know, just part of a public key secret key pair. It has nothing to do with like your social security number or any other identifying information. Uh, and you can generate for yourself as many, you know, secret um, public key pairs as you want. You can generate, you know, 10,000 of them very easily. Uh, so for all we know, you know when, we, when we look at Bitcoin and we see all these users, for all we know, there are 10,000 different public keys that all actually correspond, uh, that are all owned by the same miner. Uh, but this is what's sort of one of the magical properties about proof of work, right? So all of the miners are kind of, you know, cranking through all these possible nonces, sort of spending all their computational cycles trying to find an eligible block. And if you think about it, just because everybody basically is just doing random guessing, remember, that's the state of the art. This is sort of, we, no one knows how to find an eligible block in a way that's smarter than just randomly guessing nonces. So because of that, that means the, the probability that you're going to be the one, you know, that a particular ID is going to be the one to find the next block, um, that's going to be proportional to how much of the overall computational power you possess. Right, so like if there are 100 miners and you're one of them and all of you have the same amount of mining power, so you're 1% of the overall pool, then there's a 1% chance that you'll be the lucky one that happens to find um, the next block. If you're a bigger miner and you have, say, 5% of the overall computational resources invested in Bitcoin, you're going to have a 5% chance of being the next one to find an eligible block. And so the point to realize here is just that, you know, the probability that you get a block, that you, that you authorize a block, and remember that's exactly where the rewards come from, they come exactly from authorizing blocks, the probability is proportional to your share of the computational power. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you have 10% of the computational power all sort of invested in a single public key, or if you split it into two different identities, each with 5% of the overall computational power, it doesn't matter. So still, the probability that the next authorized block will be from you, meaning one of your public IDs, that'll just be proportional to your overall amount of the computational power. So there's really no point in creating multiple IDs um, in the sense that it cannot get you bigger rewards than you could get with just a single ID. So a lot of systems do not have this so-called Sybil proof property. A lot of systems, uh, cheap identities is sort of a really big problem. Uh, but Bitcoin really from the beginning, it was built in uh, to be robust to Sybil attacks, which is a really nice property. For the rest of this slide, I want to talk about attacks that are based on deliberate forking. So we talked about how forks can happen accidentally, but if a miner wants to be devious, they can purposefully introduce a fork. 
right? So if you know that the last block of the blockchain is, you know, say B3, and the second to last block on the blockchain is B2, as a miner, you can pretend like you never heard about B3 from the peer-to-peer -peer network and say, oh, I thought the last block was B2, and then authorize a block B4 extending B2, thereby creating a tie with B3. So creating a fork on purpose by extending a block other than the one which you know to be the last block. Now, why would you ever do this, right? Because if your block is not on the longest chain, you're not going to get any rewards for it. So what's the point of just sort of creating some new block that's basically going to be orphaned? Well, let's examine the situation, you know, a little bit more carefully. Here's how something known as a double spend attack might go. Uh, so imagine, you know, we've got some blockchain. So let's say that the currently um, last block in the blockchain is B0. And then there's a bunch of blocks that come before it. Uh, and now let's say that um, one party Alice pays another Bob, uh, another party Bob uh, in a transaction that winds up getting added to the blockchain in the next block, in block B1. So the little green circle labeled TX, that's meant to indicate the transaction, which is a transfer from Alice to Bob. That's one of the, say, 1,000 traction, uh, transactions that appear in this block B1, which is now added to the blockchain. Uh, as we saw on the last slide, you know, if you, you, know, you don't want to regard a transfer as complete uh, immediately when the transaction shows up uh, on the blockchain, because you're worried that, oh, maybe some other miner, you know, in parallel came up with a block B2. Uh, that's going to be competing with B1, and then maybe it'll so happen that some miner will wind up extending B2 with a new block B3 before any miner extends uh, the block that my transaction is in, B1. So you want to wait until more blocks get added after your transaction. So let's say uh, another block B2 gets added. And let's suppose, you know, Bob is feeling very impatient. Bob says, you know what, you know, now uh, it's clear that this transaction is unequivocally uh, on the blockchain. It's been expended, ex extended by some other block B2. All of that stuff is on the uh, longest chain. So I'm going to go ahead and ship, you know, whatever good I owe Alice. I'm going to ship that to her now that B2 has been added. So suppose that happens. Well, now what Alice can try to do is effectively rewrite history. So deliberately create a fork, uh, so create a new block, uh, B3, which rather than extending B2, as she's supposed to do, Alice will create an eligible block B3 that extends B0. Now this in and of itself seems like a waste of time, right? Because Alice created this block B3 and it's not on the longest chain. So this is a block that was sort of orphaned at birth. And so in particular, uh, no rewards are granted and it doesn't change the fact that the transaction from Alice to Bob has been authorized. But suppose Alice is persistent and keeps trying to mine new blocks, extending the blocks she's added before. So she's going to try to mine a block, an eligible block B4, extending B3, and then hopefully get lucky again and find yet another block B5, extending B4, before any of the other miners successfully find a block extending the actual uh, uh, longest, longest chain before they extend B2. Notice that if Alice gets lucky in this sense, being able to uh, create three new eligible blocks before anyone else finds one, uh, then in fact this would orphan the blocks B1 and B2. The longest chain would switch to being this magenta chain with the blocks B3, B4, and B5. And that would mean, you know, once B1 is orphaned, that means that transaction is no longer regarded as authorized. So really, Bob no longer owns those coins. Alice still owns the coins, um, but unfortunately, if Bob ships the goods after uh, B2 is added to the blockchain, Alice will both have the goods and get to keep her coins. And so that's known as a double spend attack. Why is it called the double spend attack? Well, it's because, you know, Alice can basically reuse the same coins uh, she allegedly, you know, transferred to Bob, use exactly the same coins for a transaction, you know, to some other party, to some Charlie, uh, in one of the blocks B3 or B4 or B5. So she really gets to, in effect, spend the coins twice, once in the transaction in B1, and potentially again in some transaction uh, in what winds up being the longer magenta chain. 
So what's the likelihood of a double spend attack like this working out? Uh, well, it's going to depend on what fraction of the overall computational power is possessed by Alice. Remember, because all the miners are basically just doing random guessing, the probability that Alice winds up being the next miner to come up with an eligible block, that's just that probability is just going to be equal to the fraction of the overall computational power that she possesses. So if she controls an alpha fraction of the overall power possessed by all the miners, uh, then she has to get lucky, you know, so any, you know, getting lucky once, that has probability alpha of finding an eligible block. And to pull off this particular double spend attack in this example, she would need to get lucky three times in a row. So three times in a row to beat out all the other miners uh, in finding the next eligible block. So that's going to happen with probability alpha cubed. Okay, so alpha for each of the times she has to get lucky. So the success probability depends on alpha, and um, the smaller alpha is, the less likely such an attack would be to succeed. Uh, and if you're just talking about like a single individual, a solo miner, as they're called, uh, their alpha is probably going to be quite small. Right? So even 1% would be a lot to be possessed by a single solo miner. You might expect a couple order magnitudes uh, less than that. So in that case, if it's just one individual um, you know, trying to uh, execute this attack, probably it's going to be very, very unlikely. Uh, to succeed and not worth even trying. Um, one thing that does complicate the matters a little bit uh, is there are these things known as mining pools. And this is where lots of different solo miners join forces. So they basically work uh, in tandem uh, trying to authorize a, a new eligible block. And then if anybody succeeds in coming up with an eligible block, they split the proceeds uh, amongst all of the participants in that mining pool. Uh, so why do miners do this? They do this so that they get a more steady payout, right? So they don't, it's not winning the lottery, you know, once every 10 years, you know, rather you're getting a little bit every single day. That's the purpose of the mining pools. Um, and they get pretty big there. It's not uncommon that a single mining pool would con control 20% or maybe even 30% uh, of the overall computational power. Cause a lot of these miners get together in a single pool. So if an entire pool decided to collectively try to execute a double spend attack, then this, you know, this alpha cube, it still wouldn't be that big, but it also wouldn't be that small either. Um, so you'd start having a non-trivial chance of pulling off a double spend attack if you manage to get a whole mining pool to kind of agree to, to try to do it. Now, if you're worried about a double spend attack, if, you know, alpha cubed uh, is still too big um, for your purposes, uh, definitely, you know, as, as Bob, as the, as the seller, you do have, you know, something under your control, which is, remember, this cartoon was for a very aggressive Bob who was happy to ship the good after its transaction was extended by just one block on the blockchain. So the transaction's in B1 uh, and it was extended by B2. And if Bob wants to be more conservative, uh, Bob can wait until K blocks have been tacked on after B1 before shipping the goods. Uh, and then the product, then sort of to execute the double spend attack, um, this magenta block is going to need to be that much longer. It's going to need to be of length K plus two. If Bob waits for K uh, blocks to be added after uh, the transaction, and then that probability is going to be alpha raised to the k plus 2. And remember, alpha is a number less than 1, so as this exponent gets bigger and bigger, this number is approaching 0 very quickly. So in fact, even if you did have a, a deviant mining pool with 30% of the overall uh, computational power, uh, if you took k equal to 6, so if you waited for 6 blocks to be added on top, which is sort of best practices generally for people, uh, sellers who are using Bitcoin, uh, then the probability of pulling off this double spend attack, getting lucky eight times in a row, uh, that would already be, you know, roughly one one hundredth of one percent. So a one in 10,000 chance uh, of succeeding. And with that lowest success probability, no one's even uh, going to try. Now, from the way I've discussed this double spend attack, it seems like, you know, you should be OK, even if alpha was, you know, a half or more. Uh, right. You just take K big enough and then alpha to the K plus two is pretty small. But I'm sort of assuming that the, you know, that the, the deviating miner is trying to do a double spend attack just by getting lucky K plus two times in a row. Um, and once alpha grows bigger than 50%, actually, by being patient, you can always execute a successful double spend attack, right? So if you have more than half of the overall computational power, you are going to be on average creating blocks faster than everybody else combined. And so that means you just start growing this magenta chain, B3, B4, B5. You know, maybe the sort of other miners, you know, are getting lucky sort of in between your efforts. So they will, uh, they will extend the blue chain. Uh, they'll add on to B2. But 
more frequently you will be the one adding to your magenta chain than all the other miners could possibly be adding to the blue chain. So if you're patient enough and you wait a long enough period of time, uh, no matter how big a deficit you started with, eventually your magenta chain, because it's growing at a faster rate than the blue chain, eventually the magenta chain will take over the blue chain and the magenta chain will become the longest one. So there's really kind of a phase transition when alpha hits 50%. Uh, so below 50%, you know, the odds are stacked against you, you know, like gambling at a casino, and you have to get lucky to successfully orphan the, the blue chain. But all of a sudden, when alpha's bigger than a half, you know, that's like you're the casino. The odds are in your favor. You know you're going to make money, and you know eventually you will be able to execute this double spend attack. So this, this specific case where alpha's uh, bigger than a half, uh, that actually has its own name. That's known as a 51% attack. So a 51% attack, if a, if a single miner or a single sort of colluding uh, party of miners control more than 51% of the overall computational power, that's really kind of the epic failure mode for a, an open blockchain uh, like Bitcoin. Because if one entity has more than half the computational power, they actually have total control over the blockchain. So they actually can act like a centralized authority. Now, I mean, the one thing you can't do, even with all of the computational power, is you still can't forge transactions. So you can't like literally steal uh, other users' Bitcoins. That would require forging their cryptographic signature. Um, and that you can't do no matter how much computational power uh, you have, realistically. Uh, but what you can do, for example, is censor users of, of uh, Bitcoin. You can prevent people, you can freeze their assets, prevent them from ever uh, spending their coins. How would you do that? Well, whenever they try to spend their coins and a transaction gets added to the blockchain, you do this forking attack, you grow this magenta chain to make sure that that block gets orphaned. So you never include their transactions in your own blocks, and because you create blocks faster than anyone else, kind of you have all of the say about, you know, which transactions wind up uh, on the blockchain. So really, you know, a blockchain is viewed as broken if you have one person with more than 51% of the computational power. So you should always think about um, you know, nobody having more than 49% and really even nobody having more than hopefully, you know, 20% or even less than that of the overall computational power. So these kinds of forking attacks, you know, they're important to know about. Uh, definitely Satoshi Nakamoto already recognized the possibility of these forking attacks. I um, mean, in, in the original white paper for Bitcoin, it was asserted um, that you don't have any, pro you know, the only way you have problems is if someone has more than 51% um, of the overall computational power. Otherwise, you should be good. Uh, and my interpretation of that assertion in the, in the Bitcoin white paper is that Nakamoto was thinking about uh, kind of double spend attacks uh, of this type. So thinking about forking attacks. But, you know, there's actually other ways you could deviate from the Bitcoin protocol that are not just pure forking attacks of this type. So more clever deviations, which apparently were not anticipated uh, by Nakamoto in the original Bitcoin protocol. And so in the, in the last slide, on the last video, uh, I want to tell you about the most famous such attack, a very clever attack known as selfish mining.